And the very short intro is that for a while there, if you searched up on Google and then Ken, he was the person who would show. So he was the Ken for a long time <laughs> online. Um, he is a distinguished professor, a chair professor in Ramara, professor at Cornell, where he has been for many years. Um, he got his PhD from Berkeley in 1981. He has, um, he's a fellow of the ACMI Tripoli and has all the um, several IEEE awards that I'm sure he doesn't want me listing right now. Um, but the interesting part of a lot of Ken's work is on looking at mission critical systems, mission critical distributed systems. Uh, for some of you who have taken uh, my classes or several other classes, you might have heard of virtual synchrony, ISIS, and group communication. This is Mr. Group Communication. And uh, we are very happy to have him here. Um, his uh, systems have been deployed in places like the New York Stock Exchange, Swiss Stock Exchange, French air traffic control systems in hospitals, as I just learned as well. And uh, so I'm very happy to have him here to talk about his more recent work on intelligent edge computing. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much. That was very, very nice. Okay, so um, it's great to be here. Uh, if I go too fast, can people go? Don't hesitate to raise your hand and stop me and ask for a question. Um, you guys are, you have exactly the background of the class I usually teach, so hopefully I'll, I'll get the, the level of this right. What I want to talk about is how uh, machine learning is beginning to push into uh, what we would call the edge of the computing environment. The reason people call it the edge is because these days computing is very dominated by the cloud. The cloud is a very big infrastructure, and but it's only considered to be what they call the edge of the cloud that can do reactive stuff, anything that's uh, at all real time. So you move the whole time it's still muted here. Uh, it has here. to be muted because oh. the microphone is the real source. And I can't get rid of the picture of Zoom, so <laughs> <laughs> this is a feature of Zoom, you know, you cannot get rid of the picture of yourself. It, it, this is because the room was a Zoom client right the second. Anyway, so so the question we want to ask is whether we can move machine learning into this edge environment. Um, I'll show you where the edge really is. It could be in the cloud, but that might not be close enough to where your devices are sometimes. Could also be controlled by the cloud and moving physically close to, to the cloud. And the reason you want to do that is you'd like intelligence that feels intelligent, like human intelligence. Not to get rid of people, but um, in order to, to, to help people in this happy, effective ways. So these are some of the images that came to me from Microsoft, where we get a lot of our support. This particular project is interested in agriculture. And um, what's interesting about it is that they end up with a whole bunch of different machine learning solutions to different problems, like figuring out the depth of the water in that river and whether it's going to flood those pastures, uh, or how hydrated they are right this minute, or which satellite imagery to purchase, because satellite imagery is expensive in order to augment your knowledge state so that you can answer questions for your users. And you get a kind of like a graph, but it's not a deep neural network. The graph is a graph of machine learning components where each one is a specialist. Like one node could be the weather specialist, and another node could be the river depth specialist. And they talk to each other by exchanging files and things. And then individually, they could be distributed or they could be local. They're doing what's called inference mostly, meaning that they've been pre-trained and now they're trying to rapidly decide something. Uh, but on the other hand, you might be doing a little bit of uh, fine-tuning of your knowledge too. Um, and then you can do other kinds of things as well. So one, one demo that I've got, uh, I'll show you the numbers for it, I won't run the demo. Um, we look at what happens if you've got a traffic intersection with cameras, and you'd like to really quickly sense that, uh, that this bicyclist is gonna do something super dangerous and cut off the truck in those cars, and flash, I don't know, make the telephone poles, you know, the, the, the uh, traffic poles turn red or something. And if you can do that really fast, you might prevent the accident. Uh, or help somebody uh, doing service in a factory. Uh, I don't know what this thing is that the, the woman is uh, servicing. She's wearing hollow lenses, but the hollow lenses don't have much compute capacity because heavy computing is hot and, it's, and, and the devices aren't so light. So the hollow lens is a fancy display device, but where is the data fusion happening to give her all these virtual heads up displays? And that would be an example of edge ML. Wherever that is, it's some collection of machine learning systems trying to figure out that this vibration is probably an indication of that uh, pipe on the surface. <coughs> or 
or here's a doctor, that these are all kind of fanciful. The reason that they look so realistic is Microsoft has people who do that kind of thing professionally. But so these are all what people would uh, aspire to do. Like this doctor, I pinched a nerve the other day. <clears throat> You'd like to be able to go to your doctor and say, well, when I brace my arm just this way, right there it starts to hurt. And have the doctor say, ah, that's not a rotator cuff there, that's a pinched nerve. Um, and to get that right, if you think about it, you've got to have imaging of the bone structure. You've got to have um, a dynamics model. You're going to have to do some inference to guess at what's causing a pinch at that moment. It'll have to happen under time pressure because the doctor won't put up with a lag. Um, and, uh, you know, it needs to be accurate and correct or else you're going to intervene in the wrong way. So those are the kinds of goals we have. And since everybody talks about generative AI and in this kind of setting, interactive uh, large language models, uh, you can even ask, well, do those need some kind of snappy edge response? And the answer is, in fact, they, they definitely will. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you try to ask these language models what day it is, they'll typically tell you they don't know things like that. Um, if you ask one of the language models, what is the biggest recent hurricane, you'll get an answer from 2020 or 2021. And that's because they actually got trained on data from way back then. It took this long for them to tag that data and then run the training and move it to the point where it's usable. So even with OpenAI and all of their fancy guy chat GPT, and it's still going to have this problem of being super out of date. And how are you going to compensate for that? For the moment, we take courses and they teach you what's called prompt engineering, where you build more and more fancy questions. But that, if you think about it, becomes a database. So what's really going to happen, and it's already starting to happen, there's a paper just the other day out of Berkeley on this, is you're going to start to see these large language models directly querying a kind of carefully curated, not the internet, but a carefully curated database of context information. And they'll do that in real time in order to compensate for not knowing anything that happened since you know, 2021. And that combination will make the prompting part much simpler, uh, except that the uh, large language model have to update this database. So there's this need for uh, a kind of edge database. Not a fancy database, it turns out. In fact, if you talk to your friends who do this kind of work, you realize they're working in PyTorch, it's got built-in query features anyway, or they're in TensorFlow, or they're in one of the other languages. All of them can query data. They just want tables. They want little flat tables. They may want the data to be correct, consistent, but they don't really need fancy database tools because that's built right into the language. Now, on the other hand, they do need consistency. So I hope you can see this. Um, well, that's not, not animated all that well, but I hope you can see this. Uh, this is an animation uh, that's, that, uh, I thought for a second maybe even got flipped, but in any case, that's showing uh, a wave passing through a kind of a power grid. We did this work in, with the people who operate the U.S. Northeast Power Grid, and it really started with an actual power grid circuit diagram, but they told me not to show it to people. It was considered sensitive. And so we ended up with a totally fake thing. So what you're seeing here is 20 by 20 sensors, uh, the type of IoT sensors they use for power grids are called synchrophones. And so you have 400 little squares, and each one of them is watching kind of this, what's called the phase, but uh, the phaser actually, the power grid. And it's watching this, this metric of how stable is the power grid, and somebody is, is turning a, a solar array off, or turning it off. And that's enough to disrupt the power grid, and you can see it ripple through. It's not a big ripple, and the speed that things move through a power grid is about the speed of sound, which is ample time to do something about it, like prevent this from causing circuit breakers to fail, or introduce a compensating way to dampen it down, which is the kind of thing that the power grid operators want to do. Now, what's on the left is very noisy, right? If you were trying to figure out that this wave was passing through the power grid, you wouldn't want to do it on noisy input. It turns out that noisy input is coming from the way that the modern cloud computing infrastructure stores data and retrieves it, because it's not using the kinds of stronger, theoretically rigorous models that you would learn in a course from Melina. So the kinds of things that she was just talking about when she introduced me, we learned them, but they're not automatically available to people. And if you tried to build edge systems that are very rapid and reactive, they would struggle 
against the fact that the computer system itself gets confused about what data it just saw. It stabilizes after a little while, a couple of seconds. But you don't have a couple of seconds if you're trying to react to the disruption of a power grid, or any of the other settings I just, did, just showed you. So this leads to a need for consistency for NGI. And it's one of the things we've been very interested in. It's not going to be my main topic. So I'm going to kind of zip through this because there's a sense in which it's older research that we're pulling in. But I want to show you quickly how that's solvable with the things you learn in a graduate class here. And then I want to show you the real research uh, results we're getting with newer questions. Okay. So how do we get consistency? The first thing to ask is what kinds of inconsistencies would anyone care about? It turns out that uh, there's a theory of consistency. Leslie Lamport worked on it many years ago. It's contributed to his term of work. Uh, it relates to guaranteeing that there won't be mashups where data from two different moments are sort of combined in a correct and amnesia where the system says, yep, I'll remember that. And then you ask it about that. I don't remember that. Um, it's stale data of various kinds. And modern clouds, it turns out, are deliberately architected to have all these problems because people believe that the cutting corners lets them be faster. And so a big problem is that the standard cloud file system suffers from this issue. So um, uh, the cloud is, is uh, op operated in a way that's biased towards what we would call a very asynchronous update path, meaning data that's flowing in, it's understood that it could take a while for it to be registered and sort of reflected into any kind of edge data. And so when you, when you interact with the cloud, like the easy day for uh, an auction or something, it's understood that you're actually seeing data that's probably a little bit stale. And rather than fight against that, they just buy into it. And if two people compare this at auction and eBay on the same items, they might actually see different bids. And they just buy it. They don't point it out to you. And you won't notice, and that works out OK. There's even an entire uh, methodology for dealing with things this way. Um, it, it's one of many issues that we had to address. Um, I'll, I'll tell you quickly uh, how we get around that in, in, in two seconds. Let me just make sure that everybody understands where the edge is, and then I'll show you how we solve it. So, so when we talk about edge computing, first of all, what I'm really focused on are programs that often need to run close to where data is captured because it just takes time to transfer things over networks. Um, it, it doesn't take that time if the camera is directly connected to a computer, and that might be all the difference between being able to build a medical AI and not. Did it have to be moved to some other computer over here? So there's a cluster somewhere, and where that is, it's probably not inside your favorite cloud vendor's cloud, which is a gigantic data center, someplace where power is cheap and air conditioning is no problem, and water is relatively available. It's definitely not in Los Angeles, for example. So what's going to happen is that if you're trying to automate one of these tasks, like a fancy factory or something, you've got to figure out how to put the computer <coughs> close to the devices, um, which could still involve a kind of a 5G network or something. But what we've been thinking about is this, that we're going to try to build an infrastructure which is going to pretend to be part of the cloud. So everything you learn in a cloud computing course can just work but that is actually able to put your program on an edge cluster that it controls and manages for you, so that you wouldn't necessarily think of it that way, but you get these very good real-time characteristics for applications that are built using our techniques. Okay, so this is the sort of picture that we built. And that's not an unrealistic picture lots of vendors are interested in. It gives you the benefits of the cloud, and at the same time, uh, it lets you not worry. So now, now the question starts to be, what's the architecture? If I have complete control of what's on that cluster, you still can talk to any standard cloud service like you know, Azure AI engine or uh, Data Lake from Data Bricks or something. All of that's right there, but you're not going to try to do it. You're going to think of you. I'd like to have a little self-contained service which happens to have much better programs. And the two things it's going to do, it's going to host data, which is why I showed you the inconsistency. I'd like to host it consistently. And it's going to host computation. And in fact, it's going to do that on the same computers with the goal that the, that the AI computing happens on the exact same nodes that have the data. Yeah, Fisher. Sure. Uh, is the motivation to which you're going in this thing, is the reason why you want to, uh, from 
penetration through to the edge uh, of through the devices? Is it because latency issue of the travel, or is it because of the bandwidth that the algorithm is presenting? Well, if you're often you're, you're uploading images and video, and the bandwidth that you've got up to your favorite cloud is probably not adequate to upload photos and video in real time if you've got millisecond delays before the doctor starts to be irritated. And that doctor probably won't notice a 50 millisecond delay. But if it starts to be 300 milliseconds, they're going to feel that the patient moved and the image visibly was late. And they just take off the hollows and stuff like that. So I think you haven't got much of a choice. You have to be physically situated. The compute has to be close to these devices. It wouldn't be such an issue for other types of data, um, but videos and photos are large. The other weird thing is that you throw most of it away. A great deal of the imagery coming into the cloud, you don't actually want it in the cloud. But I'll, I'll point out the pathway right now forces you to pay for storing your data in the cloud before you get a chance to decide if it was useful there. And this is a, a, if you think about privacy, it could be a, a significant concern. You're ending up with all the data and all this knowledge that you could have been switched, they shouldn't have been saved. Um, okay, so um, I, I'm coming real fast. This is a more general slide deck. Um, and because of the amount of time I have, and because people are coming in a bit slowly, I'm just sort of going to skip a few things. So don't get upset if I skip slides or don't read every line. Um, so let's, let's fix the problem for, for uh, inconsistent storage, and then we'll tackle the speed problem. And uh, along the way, I want to show you some distributed computing stuff that I think is extremely cool. Um, but it gets kind of technical like this. But. So first of all, how, how is Cascade storing data? It's going to be what's called a key value storage infrastructure. But it turns out that anything you're familiar with can be mapped to this kind of thing. So if you look, if you look file systems or databases, they can operate over what I'm going to tell you about completely standard, right, without any changes. Um, so the way these work is you have a pool of computers. This one is showing something like 12 computers, uh, organized in this case into groups of two. We call those shards. Um, an old friend of mine, Jim Gray, uh, was one of the first people to argue that you have no choice. You have to, the only way to get scaling is to break things into mini versions and then conceal that you did it. And that's where this term shard originated. And so, and then there's a timeline here going from uh, past to future down, going downwards. And then uh, a key value system, the idea is it's like files, but with entire files being read or written in, in one shot. So uh, the key is a file name, and the value is the bytes that are in the file. And things like these images are coming in, and we would call these key value put operations. I'll get to the one here. And they have to replicate, because the idea with the shard is you have more than one copy that gives you load balancing chances and gives you full tolerance. And then you know maybe our doctor comes along, and it turns out that that application uploaded us a new image. And we'd like to trigger some kind of sequence of AIs. And remember, right at the beginning, I was talking about how these modern AIs are often graphical structures with specialty experts for different purposes talking to each other, right? Like in, in that doctor's case, uh, the bone imaging is one kind of an ML, and then it has to be visualized as probably another ML. Um, the movement is probably a different ML. So these are all talking to each other in a graph. And I showed that graph way in the top, it's obscured by the knee, but the idea would be that the nodes in the graph are just labeling them as lambdas. It's a common notation to use in the cloud. Either you call it lambda computing or function computing. So it's just a standard thing. And I happen to have four in this particular picture, figuring out what there is, and then reacting to it, and then maybe rendering uh, a pinch point or something. And so you can see them talking to each other. Lambda one got the image. and said, oh, I broke it up. This is something interesting. I should maybe reorient the spinal picture, and I should check for a pinch. I guess I found one, I should render it in appropriate way. Right? Does that make sense? And the, the dashed lines here would correspond either to the programs sending messages to each other, but you can still do that in a key value way, or maybe generating a file that somebody else consumes, or generating what's called a publish subscribe event, which somebody reads out of a publish subscribe queue. There are a whole lot of, of APIs for different styles of use, but they really add up to the same. Um, they're literally built the same way. If you've ever heard of the Apache system, it's an infrastructure that's built this way. Um, so uh, then there are other people doing puts, and the idea is that, that uh, where you do the put, you get figure that out by taking the key, the file name, and hashing it just in a standard deterministic way, 
kind of randomized, modulo the number of shards, and it just tells you which shard is going to handle that particular key value pair. Right? And so there are all these things coming in, and then you have to start to ask, what should these lambdas see if they try to fetch data at a particular point in time? And even the notion of point in time is really a range because we can't synchronize clocks perfectly. And you've got the further problem that it takes a little while for a system to absorb and store its data, which is what HDFS wasn't getting right, by the way. That's the uh, Apache file system called the Hadoop file system, the one that was messing up and glitching on the lab. And uh, it was confused. Uh, it didn't realize that it sometimes had data that was still being stored, and when it would go to try to retrieve it, it wouldn't find it, it would give you the wrong version. And that was one of the reasons for the noise. Uh, so I've drawn a little frontier here. We'll call that a stability frontier. You'd like your system to self-detect when data is stable and only let people see stable data and transparently hide but delay their request just a tiny bit. It turns out to be a couple of microseconds uh, they're necessary. I wish I could get rid of that little box, too. Uh, it's, it's about 50 microseconds. And, uh, a microsecond is a millionth of a second. Um, if necessary, and so data is flooding in. After a short delay, the data becomes stable. Then you can query it, but you wouldn't even know if you tried to query it sooner. And uh, then it turns out there's even a theory inside the real time slice. There's a theory for which version to return if you have a choice. Like if there were several photos of this spinal cord, which is the one that was closest to being correct for this number? Of this time and this resolution frame seconds. And it's something called a consistent path. All of this is old. I contributed a lot to this stuff, but just the same, it's not really novel that we are using it. But what is kind of interesting is that we could put all this together and have a system that's just as fast as HDFS. In fact, it's faster and it doesn't glitch. And that was what was being used to do the uh, animation on the right, at the middle and the right. If you remember, the one on the right was very crisp. The one in the middle is a little less crisp. The difference was the one on the right, we actually annotated the records, a little tag that said what time the data is from. <coughs> the middle one, the system had to guess. The one on the left, which was very glitchy, that was the standard hidden file system. You can get it and use uh, Amazon or Microsoft version. Okay. Yeah. Quick question. So in determining those cuts or when to take those cuts, do you exploit, um, mm -hmm. you know, tolerances in, well, I can, you know, 50 microseconds doesn't make a difference, but 50 milliseconds would make a difference. Mm -hmm. So can we, because a lot of applications have tolerances, you don't have to be. Right, we're not, we're not uh, at this level of our system, we're not terribly aware of real-time deadlines. There is a level where we do scheduling and have estimates of how long this will take. You know, at this level, what we're guaranteeing is that we're, there's a specific formal definition of what we're gonna give you, but, with, within the resolution that we're able to, to deduce, we're going to give you the version that comes closest to what we believe is correct for the time that it takes to. And, and that's a deterministic calculation on a stable portion of, of this log. The, the unstable portion is still growing at the bottom, but we wait until it's stable. So it's just completely ossified. It's never going to change. And then there's a deterministic rule, and those are the versions we're going to give you. It's a consistent cut in the Wesley Lamport and, and the Chandy sets. And, um, uh, and that corresponds actually to a database property called serializable snapshot isolation, if you're interested. Um, so let us fix everything else. Now this starts to get to be much more current work. So the big challenge that we run into now is that these are time sensitive applications that are possibly generating high volumes of data under, under a lot of load. And the way that the cloud does this today, we have to be very transparent because otherwise you'll have to change your PyTorch to, and I don't know, you may be an expert at using YOLO or one of these other, uh, <coughs> but you're not gonna go in and change it, right? So we have to take standard code and trick it into working correctly in a way that preserves the illusion that you're working in a standard cloud because otherwise the slightest thing that might break it, you'll notice it. So how does the cloud work right now? When that uh, <coughs> image, in this case the physician is seeing something, whatever comes in, the first thing that currently happens is it gets put into what's called a binary <coughs> large object store, a blob store, which is a kind of key value store. Amazon commented recently that they have 300 
key value stores all <coughs> combined together into S3. One of them is their blob store. All right, and, and the blob store is for big images and videos. So that has to be uploaded. We were talking about that earlier, how this is a super slow step because videos and, and uh, images are too big. They have to be replicated. That's all happening. We talked about that a minute ago. And then what's going to happen is when your AI code tries to run, it's going to fetch data. It knows the file names, right? So it's going to fetch data, and it has to be copied back out. So that's a second copy of operation over the network, probably. Then we have to push it into the, the GPU. I don't know if people know much about GPUs, but you can think of them as a fancy calculator for the computer. You have to load your data in, and then they have pretty elaborate operations like matrix multiply, which you can pretty much push a button and say, multiply this tensor times that tensor, put the result over here. Okay, so GPUs are going to have to get the data into the GPU, and that's what the heavy arrow is. And so all these steps had to occur before any computing could occur on that image. And as you can guess, this is going to be slow. And to make matters worse, <coughs> uh, HDFS, at least, wasn't even checking for proper synchronization or providing any guarantees at all. So HDFS would give, quite aptly, give incorrect scale data, mixtures of images, things like that. So what we're going to do instead is this. <coughs> We're going to build a scaled out storage structure. And for the things that need to be time sensitive, it's going to be where the data lives. And that thing really is going to live in that box close to the factory or to the hospital or whatever. But we're going to think of it as part of the time. And we're going to use a feature that Unix has, something called shared segments. If you take a fancier operating system, of course, you learn to use these things. And it allows different programs to share chunks of memory in a way that one of them can control. In fact, it's us on the right, Cascades on the right, we control it. And I'm going to be able to selectively share data that Cascade is holding with, with this Lambda. So it just shows up in memory map regions of memory. And, um, and then the Lambda can send data back into Cascade the same way without doing any copying, which is kind of cool. We can do this with what's called zero copy techniques using um, memory mapping features that are built into the operating system that people usually don't use them very much. Um, so we can control what's in memory, and in particular, we can control what's in the GPU. So we can do things like caching a machine learning model and hyperparameters for it. And now we can actually use a very, very recent feature where when an image comes in, we can trick the system into using what's called GPU direct and cause the data to go straight into the GPU. And if you think about it, if the data that was needed to do this calculation, whatever the ML is, is already present except for that photo, and then we can send the photo straight into the GPU with this new hardware feature, then we're going to cut what would have been many seconds down to fractions of a millisecond. And that's actually what we do in Cascade. It's all secure. And um, then the lambdas trigger each other. We can get the handoffs from stage to stage down to numbers like 33 microseconds, millions of a second. And data rates uh, as high as 8 gigabytes a second. Gee, well, what's that number? 8 gigabytes per second is roughly the speed of the bus inside <coughs> your computer. So it's kind of like memory to memory copying is typically at that kind of speed. Now, this particular device isn't even the world's fastest device. And if we use a faster one, we get even higher numbers. It's what I could uh, talk, uh, a couple, the particular company is uh, Mel NVIDIA that has a division called Mel Nuts, but I could talk with you more on this. Um, so now all of this is transparent to the application. So, so we're able to, well, I can think of that two slides. Where are the machine boundaries there? Right. Well, it's a, you're talking about this picture. Yeah, exactly. It's an interesting question. The intention here is that we're going to offer what we're calling a fast path, and that will be for a piece of code that runs on a machine near one of our servers. Is. Now, then the natural question is, why should the right piece of code be on the right machine? And the answer is we just load the same code on all of them. So actually, even though I showed you nine storage <coughs> nodes, they're really also hosting the code. And now the last question becomes, well, even so, why did this particular computation run on a machine that happened to have the right stuff in the cache? And that's a scheduling issue. And we, we have a scheduler called Navigator, which is optimized for doing that right. 
And you'll see kind of the side effects of Navigator on, on performance slides because you know I'm already down to only 20 minutes left. So uh, you won't see all the details of it. I wanted to, to think about what to do a deep dive on. And I'm gonna show you one piece of the system that's new. It's interesting because it's actually theoretically optimal and no one's ever done that before for this particular mechanism. And it's kind of easy to see with it visually what we're after, but we need to do this kind of thing all over our system. So let me tell you about a kind of a hardware accelerator. It's called Remote Direct Memory Access, RDMA. And what it is, is TCP and hardware. TCP transfers data bytes. This kind of TCP, you just tell it what you want to do, you don't have to touch anything. That turns out to be very beneficial for performance, and it can run at the speeds of the modern wires. Typically, like numbers like 100 or 200 uh, gigabits per second. Sometimes it can talk about terabit, really, really fast. Way faster than the backplane of the computer in a minute. Now, one of the things I had, one of the little building blocks along the way, was to replicate data with a little shard, a group of two, three, five nodes. How are we going to do that? The cutting edge, the state of the art, is to use a protocol called state machine replication implemented by, by one of the Paxos solutions. Leslie Lamport gave it that name. Those kinds of protocols existed before. Some of them are called atomic multicast. Paxos adds an extra step and, and securely logs data so you can recover it after a crash. Internally, these protocols have a back and forth structure, two phase or three phase kind of thing. And this one is a three phase one where in the first step, messages are sent to a set of participants. So CP is trying to initiate the update. I guess that's where the image came in. It's telling Q and R, here's a copy. We have to worry about the ordering also, but I'm not showing that on this picture. And then information comes back to P, which eventually decides it's safe to commit this update and says so. But then there's still another round trip to get to the point where you can garbage work. So let's just ask, is that a good idea if we're running at very high data rates? How's that going to do? Now, on this kind of hardware, it turns out that the hardware is so fast that the data transferring step is just at the very top. All the rest is round trips. And even though the round trips are in millionths of a second, they still look slow relative to when we had moving of data. And so the effect of that is that our system ends up something like 99.8% idle. And that's not very good. So what are you going to do? In the past, you could get a PhD for any of these tricks, modifying access protocols uh, to have everybody do updates concurrently. By the way, my students got PhDs for things like this. Um, <laughs> run lots of threads. Okay. I mean, we only had three members, so that's not going to give a huge speed up, which is why I pushed it from 0.2% efficiency to 06 You've taken operating systems course, you've learned all about threads. Did anybody point out that lots of threads slows things down very often? Probably at those few course they do. So you can have lots of threads, and you'll you know you'll use your locking correctly, it won't crash, but it's gonna actually give you very limited benefit. By the time you've got 10 threads per process, overheads at different times is gonna collapse. You can batch messages thousands at a time, but the trouble is that the doctor doesn't want to wait while his batch fills up. So you're gonna to have to kick them out. And what you're gonna do is you'll go from a system which was doing one of these transfers. Now I'm trying to stream them, but it's still pretty idle. It's got these random sized batches that keep getting tied down and kicked out. And the system's still pretty idle. So what you do instead, you start to think in terms of a sort of asynchronous transformation of the protocol. So you separate out the data plane, which I'm gonna put on the left, that's the movement of all bytes, and you make that as streaming as possible. And then you separate out the control plane, and you want it to be streaming as well, just so continuously exchanging control data, because that matches much better with what the hardware is good at. You can do it at these crazy high rates, much faster than you could even copy data inside a single computer. And then that leads to transforming the standard protocols. Now again, I've only got 20 minutes left, and I don't want to spend 20 minutes on the details of this. What we did was we built a whole system around that idea. We called it Durate Chum. Now, Durate Chum is a very strong straight line wind, which you cannot see, but if you could, you would see a little straight line cloud. And if you were standing in that spot, it's like a tornado suddenly running sideways. If you go for hundreds of miles at a time, 
that one of them happened in Ithaca once and it snapped off all the trees, but only it, it looked like somebody had brought a bulldozer uh, but flying because it was on a different height. Derechos have a height. The idea here is don't get in the way of the data. Don't get in the way of this high speed transport. So it's going right toward the derecho. And the real system is built around it. And the way derecho works is we took those old protocols and we had to figure out how to map them to this model. So the data plane is the one on the left here. You can see what we do is um, for a little group, in this case it's three members. Um, we decide who the senders are based on who's got work to do. In this case, it's A and B, and I double circled them, but it may be hard to see. And each one of them has a one to, to multiple streaming thing, just like TCP, but it turns out we can ask the hardware to do that for us. So you can see A talking to B and C, and then sending a couple of messages, and then it gives C and D. And then to make things simple, we'll just pre agree on the ordering. I mentioned that we have to think about that. We want them to see the updates in the same order. We'll just make it A1, B1, A2, B2. And then eventually, if a crash occurs, you could have a messy situation. But crashes are not very common. We're running in inside data centers, in our clusters. It's not, with, not like blockchains with malicious Byzantine participants. So we're going to assume things are very clean and benign, which is what everybody assumes in the cloud. And a crash is just a sort of a halting situation. And we just have to clean it up. And so our protocol has an obligation of always being in a state that can be cleaned up. And you can express these different requirements, and then you can map the data down to a representation that streams beautifully. And what we use for that is what's called a monotonic representation. And what I mean by that is think about numbers, they get bigger and bigger, they're just monotonic numbers. We can express the whole multi-phase exchange for streams of protocols in terms of things like counters that just get bigger, or booleans that flip from false to true. All of that's monotonic. This table is actually the table used for the core protocols of Derecho, but I'm not going to explain what all the columns mean. But some of them relate to fixing the membership of the system. Um, Melina, when she introduced me, mentioned that I, I invented a thing called virtually synchronous membership management. We encode that as a set of columns in this table. The round robin protocol it turns out to be based on how many have acknowledged receiving messages. And that information is this column called end receive for messages from A and from B. So, for example, um, A has gotten all five messages from itself. C is reporting that it's gotten five, but B has only seen four of A's messages at this instant in time. Right? And this it is just changing really, really fast. And what we do, we call this a shared state table. There's a way to get this fancy hardware to also support shared memory. It really does it with its TCP style exchange of data. It's just the hardware does it for you. You can say, please write this into that section of memory. And if it's permitted, the write will occur pretty much at the speeds of what's called a NUMA machine reaching to some remote chunk of memory on the computer's own hardware unit. It's really fast. And then to implement this, what you do is each of the participants has their copy of the table. It's a, it's a distributed protocol. And um, you use this RDMA remote write feature. And you can see here A has changed its row. Each, each member owns one row and can change that row and has read-only access to a copy of the other. So there's A changing its row, and uh, B and C see the change of A's row. They don't get interrupted because that's slow. It just happens under their feet. There's no locking, which is worrying, right? It means you have to build a lock-free data structure. Maybe you've taken a course on those. There's an entire science of lock-free data structures. We had to build a lock-free distributed protocol. That uh, It depends upon what is called memory coherence, um, uh, consequential memory consistency in, in, data, in languages courses. We didn't need to assume that, and the hardware does give us that. And then, you know, so B makes a change to this row and C, and it's just happening. So these guys aren't seeing the changes in the same order because nobody's coordinating that. But the protocol is still designed to be tolerant of that degree of disorder, as long as the data is changing monotonically. And that guarantee we can get. And then we express these protocols as a, a loop over a set of if statements using a, what's called a temporal logic, an epistemic logic. Uh, that basically is just if some property holds on the table, run some piece of logic, some piece of code. And um, we do this at super high speeds. And because of 
not having a chance to evaluate continuously, you might see things jump ahead and that leads to something called opportunistic batching using monotonic predicates, but I don't have enough time to get into that. And anyway, it's just what it sounds like. The predicate is monotonic, and when I see it's true, I don't know, for 28, I can infer that it must have been true from 6 through 28, and then I can take a batch from 6 through 28 and deliver all of those messages in order. Things like that. And that's how we built our stuff. And Dorito was built this way, and it actually turned out we ended up with the first optimal version of Lamport's Paxos protocol, which is cool because Lamport has done like 30 versions of Paxos. It's got pink Paxos, faster Paxos, vertical Paxos, disk Paxos, and not one of them is optimal. And we didn't even intend for this to be optimal. It fell out of the fact that we re-expressed the standard notion of totally ordered updates in this asynchronous batch. It's a very cool accidental result. Somebody actually, a theoretician in the area, told us we had the first optimal facts. We didn't realize it at the time. Um, and there's a theory that uh, is relevant here. So, um, so let me tell you a, a little bit about a few other features, and I just tell you some performance numbers. Uh, I, it came up before I got a question about, you know, so why are things happening at the right spot? The real answer is that I have a student, Alicia Yang, which is really good at scheduling. And what we are able to do is two things. We can, with hints from the user, we can group sets of objects that an ML is likely to need to access all at once. And they get just tagged. It's just an extra little field. We call it infinity tag. And with this infinity tagging of objects, we can make sure that we put them in the same shard, we move them into a cache all at once. There's no point in not evicting them all at once, too. So we do that. And then Alicia's navigator scheduler makes uh, smart decisions, especially under load, about where she wants particular jobs to run, tasks in these graphs, and even with mixtures of graphs. And so navigator uh, is quite useful under load. And now what I'm going to do is just show you a bunch of performance uh, measurements on these experiments, because I'm a builder, and uh, very smart people have pointed out that theory and practice are always the same at all. Like, that could be optimal and super slow, right? So, uh, the cascade's gonna turn out to do super, super well. I'll just give you the, the story and then I'll run through a couple of examples. It's giving speed ups that are sometimes 10 or 100 times faster than solutions that don't have any guarantees at all. And we have these strong database style consistency guarantees. Um, it's getting the guarantee the speed ups in different ways from using this RDMA hardware, from being lock-free and asynchronous, and streaming all this work, monotonic stuff that it's hard to understand. Um, all these different features are, are contributing to the speed up. Alicia's navigator scheduler is part of it too. So let me, let me show you some real world examples. So I'll start with some stuff that's internal kind of things and then I'll end up with real AIs that we've been building using real standard stuff. So first of all, we asked, how are we competing with the very best available ways of just the basics, things like data replication? The graph on the left is showing us throughput, so speed, you want speed to be good, higher numbers. The red line on the top is showing a, a typical number for the derecho layer of, of Cascade, and it's typically twice as fast as OpenMPI, which is the high-performance computing solution that everyone uses. And you can look at the other lines and figure out what the other, but it's always numbers like twice as fast. Um, on the right, people sometimes say, well, is it stable, or did I just pick a number out of the blue and we happen to do well? This shows objects of different sizes, 100 megabytes are the Cornell Red, and in the middle and the bottom ones are one megabyte and 10 kilobytes. You can see it's very stable. Um, in fact, if you scaled it out far enough, we've done that in other experiments, you see a slight logarithmic step down. But uh, surprisingly flat, no matter how many numbers are in a group, when from four, this one actually went to 16, uh, which is blocked by one little box on the bottom. This is showing how that turns into something useful. So a lot of people learn to use something called Kafka, uh, Kafka uh, in, and then they use it for everything. It's a, what's called a pub sub solution. It's the majority pub sub solution. This is Kafka, actually a very fancy one, something called Kafka Direct. This is already made. And what it's showing is the orange is that we're getting very, very good delays. Latency is a bad thing. You want latency to be low. So smaller numbers are better. 
uh, this is a logarithmic access and uh, access and uh, a type distribution just means you know you get an average latency delay and it's very consistent right so we're getting that at different sizes of messages from my messages here are actually one or 16 kilobytes or 256 kilobytes. I'm really sorry about this box. And then you can see Kafka Direct, which was actually designed to be the world's fastest Kafka of the day. It's getting similar medians, which is the numbers that are circled there, but it's getting terrible what are called tail latencies. And sometimes you get a ridiculously long delay. Like this is a delay of seconds for something that was running mostly in fractions of a millisecond, which is really a startling and big delay. So we're doing much, much better than Kafka. Uh, okay, the people who take uh, ML courses, they learn to use what are called collective primitives. You've probably heard of MapReduce, AllReduce, things like that. So we built a, a version of those. Um, this particular job takes floating point numbers in uh, vectors. It's pretending to have vectors where it only gets long, but think of them as being 10 megabytes or hundreds of megabytes. And it's just, it's just adding it together. That's called reducing. And so everybody is supposed to end up with the same data, and it's supposed to be summed up over the four inputs, or reduce. Um, and so, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. how, how does it do with uneven workloads? Actually, we've done a lot of work on uh, our tolerance of, um, of instabilities of various kinds. The opportunistic batching thing I mentioned briefly soaks up these uneven delays. A navigator is quite good on, well, I don't have a different one for navigator, but it's very good at dealing with event-driven loads that are very unpredictable and bursting. In fact, we're going the other way and starting to ask, can we do better for navigator when we do have flows? But right at the moment, we haven't even gone there because it's doing so well. And I'll show you this. Anyhow, the point being uh, for this one, that even though everyone thinks of open MPI the Cray version as being the gold standard that nobody can do all reduce faster. They're actually almost twice as fast as OpenMPI. Uh, there's a way to reconfigure OpenMPI where it's a little less of an advantage for us. It's maybe 20% faster, but the, the things I'm telling you about are paying off even compared to stuff that everyone who builds AI is using all the time. Um, and then we went and built some real applications that Something that I'm sure all of you think about all the time is body condition scoring for cows. <laughs> <laughs> Many people lie awake at night thinking about that. And we're 10 times faster running the identical code. The, the little piece of code isn't shown here, but if you look at the paper we're doing, uh, it has just one of these little graphs, and you have to you know, situate the cow and estimate how much, how much fat she's got and whether she looks healthy and so on and happy. And um, this is comparing us with the same application running on one of the main uh, data streaming platforms called Flake, and uh, we're 10 times faster. That's what you'd be urged to use if you use Azure Cloud or uh, uh, Amazon's Cloud, or AWS. This is another one. Um, anyway, on the left, so first of all, that's the application I mentioned very early. We have a, a complicated traffic intersection, and the AI, this one, you can see it. The first stage segments the image and tries to figure out what uh, objects are there. Cat, there are taxis, there are people. Right? Then there's a trajectory prediction, but it's done differently depending on what the kind of object is, because the dynamics of a bicycle versus a person versus a cab versus a truck, they're all very different. So we have a little chain of AIs on a per type of vehicle basis. And you impose just sort of a typical mixture of models there. And then the individual circles could conceivably even be distributed and using, you know, map reduce, all reduce these collective primitives as part. So all these pieces come together, you see. What this is showing, although you can't see it, is that we can do this task in tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. We run the identical code on Azure doing exactly the way Microsoft tells you to. It's going to take seconds, which is a factor of, let's say, hundreds of changes. Um, and uh, here's Navigator. This is the scheduler that Alicia did. So these are different AIs. The first one does language translation for captioning for Zoom, actually. The second one reads a book to a child and has to check for toxicity, meaning make sure you don't read something that's just inappropriate for that age group. Um, 
The third one is a dialogue, just a normal uh, LLM. And the last one here is a 3D perception pipeline that might do assistive stuff for a car down the road. You like, let me back up and it warns you somebody's approaching. You can get fancy. So they've got these four different tasks. And we ran a mix of them under a lot of load on a scalable system. And yet again, we're way, way faster. So Navigator, just for scheduling, gives you a further factor of two to six. Um, and actually manages to run the job with half as many servers, Jim, which is cool because it frees up data servers to do more work. Uh, and it does that by uh, co-locating the work that the data it depends on and kind of grouping things so that the stuff that needs model A tend to run on these servers and the stuff that needs model B. Turns out the standard schedulers scatter everything around, but GPUs don't typically have enough memory to hold all the models you might want. And so they, keep, they end up crashing at a model. Level. They look like they're very, very busy. They're not really doing anything. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, on time. So what I'm basically showing you is that uh, really careful systems engineering and leveraging the, the hardware accelerators, we can build incredibly fast uh, infrastructures for AI, much, much better than what's out there now. You know, you read people who are anguishing about how AI is going to change the edge and where's all the power going to come from to run these and, uh, you know, it takes days. One insight that you get is Maybe those systems are wasting a tremendous amount of time <laughs> and electricity and money and could operate just, you know, factors. If you multiply things together, there are cases here which are hundreds of times faster to do the identical task on standard hardware. Even the RDMA, it's actually present in these cloud vendors in AWS, Microsoft, they have this. Um, it's a little bit hard to get permission to use it, but it's right there. They're just not using these things effectively. Um, we did it partly by having a very fast end-to-end -end path that doesn't have any copying and avoids a lot of locking. We did it partly through scheduling, we did it partly through leveraging. So it's not like one thing did it. Um, in fact, really, there's work at every level. And along the way, I actually had to do theoretical work and restructure these famous protocols, some of which I invented in a completely different way. The plus side was we ended up with an optimal version of a classic protocol. The negative is we got it about 15 years too late for me to win a best paper with a piece of work. Nobody cares about Paxos being optimal, but I did it. So it's the purpose for it. That's the kind of thing I did lie awake at night thinking about. And um, so I'm, I'm just going to stop with a, a quick shout out to my team. That there are tons and tons of students working on this, PhDs, undergrads, and then students. Some of them have ended up in industry, some of them are still working with us, some people are, are contributing very generously uh, from places like Google, even though they don't have to work on this stuff anymore. It's just a really fun project, I really need people to work with. So, thank you so much, I can take a question or two, and people who have to get somewhere else, you're allowed to hold. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Any? Bunch of the pieces that you're saying, right? But one of them was separating the control from the data and sending the rest. Okay, so that's and that enables you to do a lot more or whatever things you don't need to the But I wonder, is there an implication of this to a Because if I need it to sort of, for my next operation, I need to make sure that the data is not going to happen, then that is not helpful. Yeah, so the question is basically, uh, are there uh, substantial application numbers of applications that might need a strong stability guarantee or something before step two can occur? Um, Actually, just, sorry, my question more towards, I, yeah. is more towards, is there a theoretical way of looking at the problem for these kind of applications that would be fantastic for these kind of applications that are not necessarily? It, it is a super good question. We have an NSF proposal. Uh, we're also trying to use theorem provers to reason about these kinds of questions. I think the best answer to this is, your question is exactly the kind of thing that I think is interesting to start to think about. Um, but not that I have some sort of happy answer to it. Um, obviously, the notion of stability is a very generalizable notion. It turns out there's a hierarchy of stability. You know, we talk about being stable in a data center. We actually go through the world's fastest blockchain along the way. There's all sorts of things. 
um, the, the stable or wider area, that's where blockchain would live. We can talk about even higher level architectures uh, that might have, where you might reconfigure the set of data centers. And there's an interesting connection to something called common knowledge. But I mean, a lot of these are lines that are really interesting. One more question? I can ask you afterwards. Yeah, the question I had, if nobody has any questions, is um, you know you talked about these ML pipelines and the fact that you're trying to achieve low latency and reliability through consistency through these groups of advances that are both hardware and protocol. Um, I'm curious, a lot of times when we try to reduce the amount of work done through ML is we skip layers or we try to have different versions of the same kind of computation, which are more time consuming, less time consuming and make these choices. And I'm wondering whether, you know, um, Cascade or Directo exploits some aspect of that. No, and uh, I was talking to, to, to your visitor, Don, but I mean, it seems to me that there are huge opportunities to think about this kinds of questions. That um, if you have applications which have these kinds of AI-based speed-up options, how do you combine them into something where the platform... So this is really trying to take standard AI unchanged, record it with minimal code. Most of the stuff I showed you, at most, we had to modify maybe 100 lines of very simple pipelines. And usually not even that. So not change the application and just have it work faster, magically have it things faster. Um, when you take the next step and ask how do you change the methodology of application design, you can get it far bigger speeds. In fact, the reason people are fragmenting things like LLMs into, well, they, they call them mixed use to experts, MOEs instead of LLMs. It's the same idea exactly, is that they start to realize that if the LLMs that work so well ChatGPT, they have like a trillion parameters, which is far too many to hold on a new computer. The only way to handle that is to break the LLM up into general purpose language, you know, people who are using medical terminology, people who are using technology, you know, CS technology, people who are going to use it. And so you end up with experts for different purposes with manageable size models. And they've gotten, you know, and then you can train them faster. So there's this advance occurring on the AI and all side. And then you're also able to offer an advance. You know, if you feel depressed about AI is going to ruin the world just on power alone, you shouldn't. It's quite the opposite. It, it moved very quickly, and now we're going to fix all those issues. Um, and I think that's the situation here, too. So I just see a huge wave of opportunities. Learn to research in a great area. Okay, thanks again.